Hello, Manga Matt here with the October manga update. Uh, let's begin here with a little bit of what, uh, what can't be more than just me double dipping in my collection. This is uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, the uh, two-in-one for the uh, Stardust Crusaders uh, third part arc of JoJo. Uh, front and back cover. Uh, this is, a, again, just another gorgeous hardcover of the uh, line of JoJo mangas that Viz has been putting out with the uh, with the uh, you know fairly recent explosion in interest and popularity with JoJo now getting a dubbed release on a uh, Adult Swim now with uh, starting with the first part so that that's that's amazing uh, although I will say that I think it's Johnny Young Bosch doing the voice of Jonathan, which I don't know. I don't really. He mostly has played like teenager characters, and uh, the people in jo the people in JoJo just always seem too macho y. That Bosch just doesn't have a very macho sounding voice that I think would sound better. I just hope they. You know, it, it's the same problem I had when they dubbed uh, Gurren Lagan and Kamina didn't sound nearly macho enough in that. Uh, but hopefully, you know, since Part 3 is like my all-time favorite JoJo, that uh, they they at least do do the dubbing of that justice. Uh, but regardless, the, the volume itself, uh, you know, it's the first two volumes of the JoJo manga uh, put into this. Uh, the only part that they excluded was uh, there was originally a, I believe, a, a 20 page or 30 page um, prologue that was essentially meant to uh, catch readers up to the events of part three from parts one and two that weren't at the time translated uh, when these came out initially. And so, of course, because part one and part two were already released, that, uh, you know, there was no point in putting this out, you know, go go read those ver those volumes for yourself if you want to. Um, I guess, I don't know, maybe they could have left it in, because then, you know, somebody could just jump in and read it, in, you know, because uh, the, the fact that it's labeled as volume one would lead someone to believe that it's the beginning of that arc, uh, you know. If you read, say, part two of, of JoJo, it, there's really very little in part two that, that has any direct uh, continuity with part one other than um, I guess they, they briefly mentioned the Hamon and they briefly mentioned uh, you know uh, the existence of vampires but compared to uh, part three here where you know Dio is the main bad guy and Dio was introduced in the first part and then Jonathan and Joseph is a minor character in this series but he's he was also in part two, and then other stuff um, that's referenced throughout. Uh, at least initially, once once the main plot gets going, then you know it. There's very little that that gets referenced from the first part uh, or second parts. But needless to say, I, I think it probably would have been good to have something like that. Um, but overall, uh, you know, the other nice part too is the is the nice red colored pages. Uh, you know, with the chapter introducing Abdul uh, in the prison and then uh, I think that's the only colorized pages in this volume but then also in the back they have a one page with uh, with uh, Araki talking about his ideas and influences for uh, ver for uh, various parts of Jojo uh, namely his his uh, his inspiration and thought process behind uh, you know Jotaro himself for uh, this for this uh, arc of jo of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, uh, which more than anything, I'd probably get these just for the the nice hard covers, the colorized pages, you know, the slightly bigger format, and the little blurb at the end from Araki talking about uh, JoJo and his thoughts on it. So, you know, if you if you are interested in any of those things, definitely pick these newer prints up, especially if you haven't gotten JoJo yet, because it'll look nice on the wall with uh, you know all your other previously bought JoJo volumes that I'm sure you have. Uh, if not, you know, there's always the older volumes that are still out there and are now probably dirt cheap now to get, you know, with the new edition coming out too. So, there you go for that. Um, see, next up here, I Am a Hero, uh, Omnibus 2, which is uh, volumes 3 and 4 uh, collected here, which uh, 
I, I absolutely love this series with, uh, you know, the, the fact that the main guy, um, Hideo Suzuki, uh, he's, he's so very off, he's so very off mentally, like, he legitimately thinks he's going crazy because of all these people running around, like, like, eating people and stuff, like, he's, he's legitimately freaked out, and, and he's having small mental breakdowns the whole time. In fact, the only thing that calms him is you know his gun like every like when he starts thinking about his gun because he's a he's a gun enthusiast so he owns a i think he think he actually has like a permit he says for owning a hunting rifle and i think it's something about like like it, it's something where he's he's allowed to own it like on a on a very conditional basis or something and and uh, you know, just all of that, and especially when he gets into it with uh, this other girl he meets, especially when he when they're uh, going over gun safety, like he's talking about, like, all right, you want to hold you want to hold position when you fire it because there may be a delay because the because the because the bullet may have been a dud. You have to hold position for ten seconds. So he's like, he's like, now make sure you line up the shot with the sights, and you know which is your dominant eye. Like he's going through a lot of these. A lot of these very detailed safety tips because uh, because uh, he's such a nerd about guns and about gun safety and stuff that he, even when there's a flesh-eating zombie like right in front of them he wants to make sure that she holds the stock like right up to her shoulder so that there's so that uh, you know there's little kickback or resistance it's it's actually kind of hilarious how detailed he gets into it and, and that and also where they're uh, they're riding on the bike together, and and uh, you know he's he's complaining that he's not really in good enough shape to really do the bike riding himself, and he has to let the little girl, like the the high school girl, do the biking. is pretty funny. Overall, again, it, if you like zombie zombie stuff, uh, or you just want something that's more different, uh, he because again he even though it's called I am a hero, he's very not. Uh, traditionally heroic in that fashion, although I guess maybe that'll uh, change later. Uh, the only thing I'm a little disappointed is, uh, you know, on the back cover there features uh, some penguins, and I guess on the front cover too, there's like, you know, he's in a penguin museum, in like a penguin reserve, in like a zoo. I think he's also seen here holding like riot gear with a with a spear, like a kind of homemade spear kind of thing, but uh, he he actually doesn't wear this at all in the mon in these volumes of manga, which it's a little disappointing. Like, they could have got any other kind of pose of him or any kind of stock photo of him from the manga or something to work with, but they they pick something that's not happening in the volumes here. I, I'm sure maybe that's in like the next installment or something, and they they just they just mixed up which parts happen when. But regardless, I, I really like it a lot. So let's see. Next up, we have a uh, Tokyo Ghoul Volume Nine, which. Uh, Again, takes uh, which now uh, continues proper the uh, the events following the Ahogiri uh, tree uh, the Algiri tree operation uh, from volume eight that ended volume eight with uh, all the characters now kind of going in their own directions. Uh, th this actually had some interesting uh, uh, plot development, specifically from um, from uh, what's his name um, uh, the the guy in. The guy at CCG, the, the uh, I don't know, this guy, he, and how he's, uh, kind of go dealing with the fact that, uh, of all the, uh, stuff that's, uh, happened from the tree fight, and, you know, they, they let some of the, some of the guys go, they couldn't get everyone, um, and they're kind of having to recoup and sort of re, and reallocate their resources together. I, I definitely like the, the, changing up between focusing on the ghouls and Kaneki versus uh, the CCG and uh, and their and their main protagonist guy uh, I think that's a pretty neat kind of uh, relationship they're going with uh, between the two uh, and also the ongoing kind of mystery they're introducing here that uh, that the experiments done with Ken Kaneki uh, with sort of creating a half ghoul has a has actually led to uh, further experimentations trying to create more half ghouls using Risa as a sort of a guinea pig uh, because I guess her Kagune uh, it, there's 
it's a very unique version of her specific version and and that it I guess it lends itself to ver to have the best chance of of a successful transplanting uh, in, in of an organ into a human's. Uh, so overall, I think it's really cool. Kind of kind of weird that you know it's there's only technically five more volumes of this. Uh, it's also interesting that it's maintained, uh, you know, even volume one and a lot of the subsequent volumes have maintained a high position on the uh, New York Times best-selling manga list. So it just goes to show you that people do love uh, horror and horror-themed stories. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, how you present it. It, it might also be that, I mean, uh, it, this is kind of similar in ways, I guess, to Parasite, which was a big deal. Um, for a while and then also again it's kind of I guess because it's technically like the most adult sort of uh, sort of a shonen-y battle manga type that's come out uh, that may be part of it too uh, then let's see uh, next up we have um, uh, the ghost and the L okay I, I'm not really sure how to ca how to how I'm gonna list this and I when I'm listing it on the on the uh, uh, description box, so I'm gonna just do my best here. All right, this is um, the main. The main series is, I guess, it's called the Black Museum, but this first story is the Ghost and the Lady, and this is book one of the Ghost and the Lady story from the Black Museum series. So, okay, there you go. I guess that's that's what I got. essentially this series follows um, the this woman who's sort of a caretaker at uh, the Black Museum, which is apparently a, uh, a place in Scotland Yard that uh, takes place, it, this takes place in I guess the uh, 1700s or so, judging by the way they're, uh, the way they all, uh, um, or maybe sooner, I don't know, uh, it is a cur she's a curator in the Black Museum, which is in Scotland Yard, it's a place where uh, weird, unsolved, mysteries uh, they they keep the evidence from weird unsolved mysteries or any kind of weird peculiar objects that find their way there they they keep and store them in it and uh the item in question that's the sort of the uh impetus of this story is a is a item collected in the 1856 it was a it's apparently a artifact of two bullets that collided, merging together, and uh, this was this was apparently collected uh, from uh, a ghost type figure called the Man in the Gray, who becomes the main the main sort of a uh, narrator for this particular tale, at least. Uh, the Man in Gray, or as he's also referred to as uh, the Gray Man, or as known as a uh, gray or gray man he's he's essentially a ghost that haunts the the theater of Drury Lane or it's it that haunts Drury Lane which is known for holding a you know big uh th big uh you know theater productions and he and uh, the woman wants to speak to him because she wants to know the story of how of how exactly uh, these two bullets came to be that they were collided together and and essentially he goes into a long long story about essentially all of his life and all of the happenings in his career as a as a duelist and then as a ghost of uh, of Drury Lane uh, and also his his uh, relationship with one particular woman in his afterlife known as uh, Florence Nightingale who you may know, uh, Florence Nightingale is the is a woman from history who actually founded uh, what became modern nursing. She was essentially the first nurse in in you know history. The, a woman, uh, a per, a predominantly woman uh, employed service that assists doctors uh, in medicine and. It was a lot of her and a lot of her influencing that that actually helped to change the landscape of of uh, how medicine and medical treatment was being administered um, and and uh, that's actually kind of the interesting part of this uh, of this story here. Uh, one part though that uh, 
that uh, uh, she has this looming kind of fear and this self-doubt in herself, which, uh, which manifests as an idolin, which an idolin is just a fancy word for like a spirit or an apparition. Uh, I looked it up. Apparently, it was used in like Greek literature, uh, in Greek tales. Uh, but essentially, in here, idolins are essentially like kind of your personality. And and uh, what's interesting though is that whenever uh, characters are are in are having some kind of an argument or discussion, like it's portrayed whether or not you know the person is winning or losing an argument based on their idolins. Uh, fighting each other like uh, she's here talking with her mom and dad and her mom is like is like throwing insults at her and it's represented with her idolin literally sh hurling arrows and and jabbing her with uh, spikes uh, you know talking about talking about uh, you know how she's becoming an embarrassment to the family uh, which I thought was a fairly interesting kind of idea to go with uh, you know Obviously, it's got to be inspired by, you know, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and uh, Stan's. But it does at least go in its own kind of direction, especially with the man in gray who uh, who actually, because because Florence Nightingale's Eidolon is so, it is sort of turned on herself and then he defeats her Eidolon that he essentially becomes sort of her guardian and fights on her behalf. So... It kind of goes in this interesting idea in the series about how uh, he's fighting on her behalf and whenever he defeats one of these people's idolins for her behalf, she essentially wins that argument and sort of becomes more confident over them. Uh, and that that's kind of an interesting twist on it. Um, the other interesting thing brought up in here is, uh, is he eventually comes across a, another duelist as a spirit form. Uh, and this spirit is actually the spirit of a duelist who actually defeated him in combat and killed him. That duelist being uh, Le Chevalier uh, de Beaumont uh, Deon, who is, a, who is also an actual real historical figure. Uh, he, especially given in today's culture where we talk about, you know, transgender rights and everything, and, and that's become a larger topic of discussion. It's interesting that you know, like we had we had the imitation game like last year that focused a lot on on uh, you know a, the accomplishments of a man who was gay, and then we also had the Dallas Buyers Club, which also focused a lot on people who were gay, and that there has yet to be a definitive adaptation or retelling of the life and adventures of. Uh, the Chevalier Dayon, who is maybe the most fascinating and maybe possibly important uh, transgender uh, in history. Maybe about well, okay, there was that one biopic about that person who 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 underwent the first ever transgender uh, reassignment, sex reassignment surgery. Uh, that person, uh, that you know, that was pretty interesting, but. You know, uh, Dayon himself was uh, was like a duelist. He was almost unmatched. He would he would regularly fight as a woman in woman dress. He was also a spy for the French, very successful spy for the French. Uh, just is in, endlessly interesting. Maybe uh, like you almost hardly ever see anything about him or her uh, as he eventually came to refer to himself as uh, the only. The only thing that ever gave him any recognition was the uh, the um, 2005, I believe, 2006-2007 uh, uh, anime Le Chevalier Dayon, which, which um, you know, at the time that I watched that anime, it was uh, interesting and unique. But then the fact, learning about it later and reevaluating it, like the fact that Dayon Dayon was a transgender and. In the anime, it's explained that the that him switching genders is because he's possessed by the soul of his dead sister. It really, it it really just kind of paints a bad image about about it, because you know it's like this was a real historical character who, and you're basically saying that his that his transgender identity was the result of some kind of hocus pocus magic thing, not. 
a not a uh, something about themselves, their personality, their their how they view themselves. It's it's just I don't know. It, it's hard to really think about it nowadays about it. But you know, aside from that, uh, the go the Black Museum I think is absolutely wonderful uh, to check up and read. Um, especially I like the. Uh, the uh, art style here, which which actually has a lot of throw, it feels very like old school manga with a lot of with a lot of uh, bold lines and a lot of uh, you know kind of highly expressive faces uh, you might find in maybe something in the 80s or such. I uh, really like it a lot, uh, and especially you know coming in a hardcover, you know gotta get it for that. Uh, and next up we get a. Case Closed, Volume 60, which I find it's, you know, it's a milestone, you know, 60 volumes of Case Closed, and this is, and this is a manga series that has gone on well, well past its anime counterpart, at least stateside. Stateside, it, like, Case Closed only ran for, uh, you know, five seasons, uh, you know, only six of the movies were actually dubbed in English. But again, in Japan, the series is going strong. Uh, the 20th movie premiered maybe like a month ago or something. Uh, still going hard, go, still going strong. Uh, it's also fascinating that, again, they still keep the English language names from the anime in the, in the manga itself. Like, the, the dad is still known as Richard Moore. The, uh, you know, the kid is still referred to as Jimmy Kudo. Uh, a lot of the other main characters are referred to their English dub version names. Um, you know, it maybe it would have made. It seems like you know, in hindsight, maybe it would have been better for them to just keep the original Japanese names and not go that route. Uh, because you know, it seems like now they're they're kind of stuck in that uh, that sort of pigeonhole name thing. Uh, and also, it's interesting that uh, it this volume actually got on New York Times bestsellers list uh, last, like a few weeks ago, uh, for on the top ten list. So people are still buying it apparently, uh, which is great. Uh, this volume uh, deals with uh, you know the aftermath of the karaoke murder from the last volume, which uh, was a pretty neat one. Uh, you know, you the whole using a using a vending machine. Uh, to uh, to sort of hide a murder weapon, um, and then and then uh, what was it? The other one, um, the other the other murder mysteries. Oh yeah, about the uh, the kid who was uh, who was uh, trying to um, it, another one of the junior detective league detective stories, which uh, which I thought was pretty good. At least it at least it was easier to solve than a lot of the other ones usually are because there were no puns in it. Uh, and then the uh, the one the one mystery that that did the bulk of this volume, uh, the Hammer Man murders, which of course I immediately think of uh, MC Hammer. I think of Hammer Man, uh, but this is somebody who apparently has been going around uh, targeting uh, long blonde, long haired blonde women and uh, murdering them with a hammer, and uh, them actually finding and uh, and uh, uh, solving the mystery of who who's done it and. Uh, and uh, uh, and and how that and how that actually plays out. It was actually a pretty interesting kind of murder mystery. The only part that that uh, that I didn't like was uh, part of part of their uh, scheme was wearing platform boots to commit crime so that it would throw off their height. Which which you know it's one of those things that like you would hear and think about in in mystery stories but in real life nobody has ever worn like platform shoes or or shoe or any kind of footwear that that makes them appear taller than normal it, it just doesn't happen like nobody does that because it's so hard to walk around in and usually when you're trying to commit a crime you want to be as quick and swifty as possible at which you can when you're wearing long larger shoes at, like that and then also it's usually really easy to spot so then so then it just makes you look more suspicious if you're wearing some kind of weird footwear like that it, it's one of those things that I was kind of like oh come on uh, and then 
one more in there that was uh, Richard trying to get on some kind of reality TV program that they wanted him for, kind of like cops, where they follow him around, and then and then it turns into a locker room mystery when it turns out one of the people of the show uh, killed themselves in a in a locked room and trying to figure that out. Which that was actually a fairly neat kind of story because you think it's one it's one suspect and then it turns out it's a different suspect and then and then it's and then there's even more of a twist on what was going on with the murder. Uh, and it was it was very neat. Uh, again, I always like it when the when the volumes end with the conclusion of the of the uh, murder mystery, so that you know I have I have a good I don't have to try and remember details from the previous case going into the next case like that. Uh, it's always pretty nice. Let's see. Next up, uh, Kuroko's Basketball Volume Three and Four, which uh, this basically uh, deals with them. Uh, Plet with Seirin High uh, going through the Inter High qualifiers um, against uh, the the Seho High, and uh, you know, may, and mostly this is them dealing with um, with one particular uh, athlete uh, known as known as a uh, Midorima, I think uh, is his name uh, Midorima. Um, it's yeah, Shintaro uh, Midorima, who is a uh, Ah, excuse me. Who is a uh, who? He's he's essentially this uh, this shooter who supposedly never misses a basket. Like he's so good, like he, he whatever shot he he goes for, he always makes it. And he's also highly superstitious. He only he listens to the horoscope like religiously. He he always makes sure that everything is in alignment. Uh, like uh, astrologically for his games that he plays. So it's kind of a neat, interesting little character tidbit about him, uh, and especially when they're playing the bat, when they're playing basketball, and how uh, a lot of the players, you know, they use they use a lot of techniques that they learn from martial arts to uh, allow them to run better, to uh, knock tires easily. Uh, that's all kind of interesting, and then how the team actually breaks down. How to play better against them, and and it all it all builds to a very interesting kind of climax in their fight in their uh, basketball game together. Again, I really love it a lot. I think I think in just the first four volumes, uh, I love it maybe as much, if not more, than uh, Slam Dunk, which I I really liked Slam Dunk. Uh, but I think this just has a better, more memorable cast of characters uh, for their team. Uh, and also, the, there's a more development given to a lot of the the antagonists in uh, that series. And uh, next up, we get uh, Master Keaton, Volume Eight, which uh, is one of those ones where again, um, I can't uh, I can't remember a lot of details about this volume. I, this is one of the ones I read earlier in the month. Uh, so when I so I read it, put it down, and then kind of forgot about it. There's, again, there's a there's a few interesting ones like uh, let's see. Oh, the one there's one here where uh, there where a bunch of businessmen are tra are trekking through a mountain because apparently that that's gonna that's gonna uh, settle a decision for who gets promoted or something. Whoever climbs the mountain and does it best, and then they hire Keaton to uh, assist on the expedition and evaluate who did the best job uh, trekking the mountain. Which again, it shows a lot of interesting ideas for uh, Keaton and his uh, survival skills training and how that relates to them uh, surviving the, the being on the snow-covered mountain. And then, uh, and actually in here there's a fairly good uh, story with, um, with Keaton and his uh, first ever encounter with his uh, friend and eventual uh, uh, business partner uh, O'Donnell. I think his name is O'Donnell. Um, yeah, O'Connell. Yeah, with his uh, friend O'Connell, who he eventually partners up with uh, to work on uh, insurance uh, with. After O'Connell is brought onto a scene where supposedly someone was murdered. And then, uh, and then also uh, figuring out details uh, based around the uh, archaeological finds and 
Keaton offering his insights, which lead to the discovery of it. And then, uh, oh yeah, this this one story actually uh, was maybe my favorite one of this volume. Now that I remember it, it was a it was a story focused around uh, a son who his father used to be a uh, used to be very wealthy in his business practice, but then his business went under, and the son who was going to follow in his father's footsteps refused to, and then became a piano player. And as his as his father's business failed, his son's uh, talent and uh, and quality of piano playing uh, went up, and he eventually became rich playing piano, and his father became poorer and poorer. And uh, you know, it's it's a lot of uh, the story involves a lot of reconciliation between father and son. You know, the father trying to do what's best for his son, and then the son. Uh, being resentful and the father, uh, you know, in, in some ways uh, being too stubborn to, to, both sides being too stubborn to just be the first one to, to forgive the other and then try and, you know, patch things up to have a relationship again. Uh, you know, it felt very, felt very genuine and very real as far as, you know, what two people could go through uh, like that. Uh, again, you know, not a lot. Not all of uh, Master Keaton's stories necessarily uh, go through any kind of uh, any kind of like big action or something. Except for uh, this next part here, you know, as I say that, with uh, where he actually has to hunt, where he's actually uh, brought in to uh, track down someone known as the uh, the Scarlet Killer, mostly because he's uh, he's a former uh, KGB uh, member of the KGB who. Uh, who's a killer, but the thing about him is he never brings a weapon anywhere with him. He always uses something around him to kill someone with. He might break off a branch and stab you. He might he might break a teacup and cut you with it. He might even use your necktie and strangle you. Like he's he's so adverse uh, he's so uh, you know, adept at at combat and everything that he doesn't need to bring any weapons on the scene. So, it presents an interesting uh, an interesting conflict with Keaton, who himself is also a highly, a highly effective, uh, you know, uh, in hand-to-hand -hand combat and, and you know, uh, survivalist training, uh, you know, to bring him on the case. Again, I always love Master Keaton. He's always, always a nice, interesting bag of different stories, which again is a credit to the how well the characters are are presented. That you can have such a wide for wide variety of different kinds of stories because of how well the characters are done in the series. Uh, speaking of uh, interesting and well-designed characters, uh, we get... This is not exactly a manga, per se, in the traditional sense, but it is, uh, you know, in relation to it, and, you know, I had to pick it up when I saw it. This is uh, the Attack on Titan anthology that uh, Kodansha Comics put out that was a... Uh, an anthology series collection uh, revolving around the uh, and related to the various uh, you know characters and ideas presented in uh, Attack on Titan, the uh, manga series. Uh, all of these stories are mo are uh, done by American uh, and maybe a few uh, European uh, writers and artists. Um, some of the uh, more some of the more uh, well known ones. Um, yeah, you have uh, under the first story, which is actually by uh, Scott Snyder with uh, Raphael Albuquerque, which is kind of a sort of beginning of the fall of Attack on Titan, and also the, all the Attack on Titan four-panel quickie stories by uh, Evan Dorkin and uh, Sarah Dyer, uh, which are uh, which are also hilariously done, um, and then really the the rest of them. Uh, the rest of them I can't even. Oh, one is a good dog by a Gail Simone. Um, a lot of these again, I, I just some of them don't even know really. Uh, they're really who they are, what they're from. Uh, I know a lot of them get a lot of have done things, but uh, I, I thought they were all pretty pretty fun. Again, especially the uh, Evan Dorkin uh, Attack on Titan uh, four panel comics that he does uh, in uh, sort of in in betweens with the various. Uh, stories. Um, again, if you're a big Attack on Titan fan, it's definitely worth picking up. 
Um, if you're kind of, if you just like the anime or something, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's really that great. Uh, which, which uh, you know, it may maybe you know I'm losing a little bit of credit by not endorsing this enough. But you know, I think that uh, I think that one, this there could have been more. Uh, put into this like I think there could have been they could have maybe got more material uh, maybe but you know for what they got it was fine uh, I don't think there was really it, it's a lot of spoof kind of ideas there was maybe one or two stories in here that I thought were very interesting from a from a storytelling perspective and also the other the other weird thing is that uh, they they mentioned that some of them are canon and some of them are not which you know I don't think I don't consider any of it canon. I don't even consider any of the any of the spin-off manga and novels canon. I mean, as in my mind, and I'll admit I have a very traditional, strict sense of how canon is in my mind. You know, it's the way I see it is that like something as straightforward as like say Attack on Titan, like unless Hajime Isayama acknowledges it within the text of the story that it that one particular piece is canon. I don't believe it's canon. Like, um, like, like for instance, like the Wizard of Oz books. Like, whatever Frank L. Baum wrote, I consider that canon. Anything that was written after Frank L. Baum was involved, I don't really consider that canon uh, because it was after he finished writing it. Um, also, same thing. Like, uh, you know, they did the prequel for uh, the Wizard of Oz, like the Oz Great and Powerful. I don't consider that canon whatsoever to the Wizard of Oz uh, movie or anything because, you know, it, it didn't feel like in the same spirit or anything. Um, whereas, like, uh, so, whereas some stuff I would, there, there's some stuff that I might, that I would consider canon. Like, a lot of the Doctor Who stuff, like, they've more or less said that, like, everything and nothing is canon in Doctor Who, uh, Batman. I would consider basically every comic book of Batman to be canon because it's all in order. It's all they all reference into each other in DC. Like, like you know, whenever you do a continuation of a comic series where it's from one writer to another, I consider all of that canon because they they acknowledge the events that preceded them and and they don't try to they don't necessarily try to say stuff didn't happen from the previous storylines or something, at least not usually. So, as far as something like Attack on Titan anthology, like, I don't believe the the idea that it's that it's canon uh, in terms of just what, what someone said. Even if it's the writer himself says that it's canon. Like, unless there's something in this that's then referenced in the main story. Like, I don't consider that. But again, that's just me ranting again about something that's, you know, only... That only you know fanboys and and nerds think about with this stuff. Let's see, next up we have uh, Food Wars, uh, Shokugeki no Soma, uh, Volume Fourteen, which is uh, the conclusion of the of the uh, what do you call it the their their uh, their assignment thing that they were on, where they were working the working in the uh, the food the food uh, thing. Again, you can tell this was the earlier of the month because I can't remember a lot of details from it. Uh, namely, with them uh, working to try and make a dish uh, that they can then uh, serve in their restaurant. Uh, this is this is also uh, Soma actually learning how to cook in a French style restaurant. That was kind of the main focus of this volume was was Soma clashing with. Uh, with uh, Shinomiya, who is uh, a, who is the main guy featured on the front here, and Shinomiya wanting to run it like a French restaurant, and Soma, who is more traditionally Japanese. So the main so the main conflict was initially uh, Soma not being able to uh, to cook for a five course or three course meal because uh, that's how French traditionally serve their foods, in, and uh, you know it involves. Soma making sure that he's cooking while he's finishing the first dish he has to make sure he's also working on the next dish so it can be served right when the customers finish that first dish again and also multiply that by 20 or so times for everybody in a restaurant 
Uh, so it it gave an interesting light on how uh, on how different things are done in uh, French cuisine versus Japanese cuisine, and also some detail about why certain uh, menu items might not be as commonly used in French cuisine from Japanese. Uh, so overall, I thought it was a pretty good one. The only downside I would give is uh, the lack of uh, the lack of recipes presented in this volume. Although there were a few recipes that were actually given inside the manga itself, so at least there was something there. And uh, next up, uh, Assassination Classroom Volume Twelve, where uh, the kids actually go face to face with the Grim Reaper, who is essentially an assassin who targets other assassins and and he himself has actually targeted uh, Kuro-sensei, and he believes the best way to attack Kuro-sensei is through the kids. Like, he would capture the kids and then threaten them and then use that as leverage to, uh, to actually lure Kuro-sensei into a position where he could then kill him. Viewing Kuro-sensei as essentially, I guess, the most, the most uh, satisfying kill that he can acquire. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting uh, volume here with uh, all of the kids, uh, you know, showing a lot more of their assassin skills and coming up against someone who is clearly completely outmatching them in terms of, uh, in terms of assassin skills. And uh, next up, Inuyashiki Volume 5, which actually shows an interesting turn with uh, Shishigami, who previously was very antisocial and you know, mostly sociopathic, but now since living with a uh, with a girl and her grandma, uh, he's since uh, kind of I guess developed sort of a sort of a uh, you know a conscience, and he's actually wanting to kind of try and do good, which is a interesting turn. So it'll be interesting to see uh, you know how long that lasts or where that goes. Then uh, let's see. Next up, Ajin Demi Human Volume Eight, where we are still fighting in the tower. With uh, with uh, what's his name? Uh, the the one guy. Uh, you know, it's the guy. It's against uh, yeah, Sato. Yeah, K and Co and company are still fighting Sato in in the tower. This like, it's really good, but like, how long is how long is like is this fight gonna last? It's like Die Hard. It's like if you made all three Die Hard movies into one Die Hard, like. It literally is die hard because you know you can't die. This is a little joke, uh, but it is interesting uh, to see all the different ways that Sato has been circumventing security and stuff that they've been using to try and fight him. Even knowing that he's a demi-human, Sato is coming up with weird new ways to circumvent their security, all while using his skills as a demi-human against them. And, and also, even the fact that he's fighting against other demi-humans, like, he's still outclassing them. It's, it's just, like, they keep underestimating him because they don't know how far he will go to complete a mission. And, you know, part of it is, you know, Sato's prior experience as a military officer that, I guess, makes him more convicted and more willing to go to the extreme, especially given that, you know, he can't die anymore and and uh, all the different weird tactics he uses it, it's very fascinating it's very fun to to read it's a shame that that it's a shame that there's not as much plot really progressing as i would like especially given how few how uh how sparse these volumes are coming out that's the only major complaint is that there's a i know that he's probably the the main guy what's the name uh gamon sakurai He's got a lot of ideas going on, but it's just that the time it's taking him to get those brought out is is very is taking a long, long time. Um, then uh, we have here Shigeru Mizuki's uh, Kitaro. Kitaro meets uh, Narahion. Nor Nora Narahion. Uh, this guy. This old guy. Uh, this is the next volume in the uh, Kitaro series, which are, again are are done in this kind of more uh, more um, digest sized version. But uh, you know, I really uh, I really like this a lot um, with the uh, with the neat uh, 
again, Shigeru Mizuki's artwork, uh, when he wants to draw in this very somber kind of detail, it's just, it's just immaculate. Like, just, like, just looking at these backgrounds and stuff that he draws, it's so much detail, so, so well done, and, and also the interesting, uh, you know, comparison with his very cartoonish, uh, yokai and main characters is, uh, it's just very interesting, and I really like it a lot. Uh, the only downside I would say is that, uh, you know, if you can't if you can't get your get your mind into uh, the the spirit of Kitaro, uh, in the spirit of kind of what these stories are about, uh, like Kitaro isn't really this very actiony kind of character. Like maybe if you read uh, Nura Nura Rise of the Yokai Clan or Yokai Watch or something, where there's there's a very clear. There's usually kind of a more clearly defined antagonist and more of an ongoing plot. There, there really isn't for Kitaro. Kitaro is just he'll he'll come across some yokai that's causing trouble and he'll show up, beat him, and like that's it. End of story. There's no there's no moral lesson. There's no kind of thing that leads to another arc somewhere or or anything. It's just it's just kind of a, a showcase to kind of. Hey, here's a yokai, and then they do it, and you know I like it because it's very cool and offbeat. But uh, you know I can understand how someone with a more modern sensibility of uh, stories and and stuff would kind of be turned off if they don't like very easily resolved conflicts in their stories. But again, that was just how Katara was done. And uh, next up, we get a. Seven Deadly Sins, Volume 16, which uh, features more of uh, more of a uh, more detail on, I guess, the uh, Ten Commandments, the the ten demons who have breached into uh, the real world and from the demon world, and uh, them trying to fight them, and also a return of uh, of a uh, what's his name from uh, the who, who was previously thought dead. Um, the the guy uh, shit what's his name um, Dreyfus both uh, no not Dreyfus uh, what's his name um, Hendrickson yeah Hendrickson who was previously thought dead uh, or at least out of the picture is uh, now returned and then also there's an interesting uh, backlog back detail talking about uh, Diane and sort of her relationship with uh, with the giant clan uh, which uh, this does. This does do some uh, very nice kind of uh, character development, uh, and also talking more about the giant clan, which got which you know the series has done a good job kind of uh, going on about the fairy folk and everything and detailing that out. But now you know I guess it's time for talking about like the giant people, which which the giant people I guess were kind of in this series kind of viewed as sort of mercenaries, like they would just fight. Uh, when they're given, you know, the, the money and the resources to do so. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Then uh, next up we have Pokemon X and Y. Uh, this is Volume 8, which uh, goes into more detail, I guess, about uh, the, ma the main plot of uh, them finding Xer Xerxes. And uh, Xerxes actually uh, becoming the, uh, train the, the uh, partner for, uh, for um, I think, X, actually. And then also a, also the inter reintroduction of uh, of Blue from uh, the Pokemon Adventures and how he's currently after uh, the third uh, legendary uh, Zigar Zigar Zigarde or Zygard, um, which which uh, he's believing that uh, much like Kyogre and Groudon and Rayquaza that uh, that Z that Zygard. Uh, is going to uh, play a part in in sort of a balancing between uh, Yevoldal and uh, uh, Yeveltal and uh, Zer Xerneas, uh, and that him finding and capturing it will uh, will do just that. And uh, you know, I thought that was pretty interesting to bring back uh, uh, Blue for this uh, series. You know, it's always great when you see callbacks in a lot of these long running series from uh, previously thought, you know, long gone uh, characters. Let's see, next up we get a Samurai Legend. Maybe the most bland and uninteresting title I have ever seen for a manga series. It, 
Like the only the more bland you could get was may, would maybe be like a manga that's literally called manga, which I actually have that. It's pretty hilarious. But Samurai Legend, like, th how do you even get any details out of something like this? So, so essentially, this is the uh, story of a uh, Jubei of uh, the Samurai Jubei, and uh, his and his and a tale from uh, of one of his uh, you know struggles you know in in Japanese uh, Japanese history um, Yagyu Jubei maybe one of the most famous and legendary swordsmen in all of Japan's history um, and I do I will say this though that uh, it's got Jiro Taniguchi's art style but the only problem I have with Taniguchi's art style is that he just he just doesn't do really good dynamic action for me like like whenever they're fighting, they they still kind of feel a little too stilted, a little like there's not enough action in places. Uh, there's another one in this update that I'm gonna get into talking about that. But needless to say that like from a samurai perspective, like it it Taniguchi's better done when it's doing a lot of dialogue or when there's a lot of minimal kind of action uh, to make that kind of look more interesting and dynamic uh, when. When you're actually trying to do a lot of dynamic movement and action, he just it just doesn't look that good. I think um, you know there's a few there's a few instances where it does look pretty good, but needless to say, I think that uh, maybe it was just on the fault of the uh, of the uh, uh, the writer not knowing where or how to place panels or something. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, you know. There's a lot of blame and you, to put around when you're not sure how something was done or not done. Uh, but needless to say, uh, if you're a big fan of samurai stories and especially more historically accurate samurai stories, uh, there is a lot of detail that is put into uh, samurai legend here. Uh, specifically, they they blot, they outline stuff like uh, you know the the namings of the different of different terminologies here. Uh, they also detail a lot of background info about the characters and the time that it's all taking place. Um, even even acknowledging that some stuff may or may not be as accurate of information as could be. Uh, you know, given that Yagyu, that Jubei Yagyu is such a it, is such a very prominent figure in in a Japanese history that sometimes hit the mythical stories are blended with the more historical stories so it makes it let it makes it more difficult to uh, discern the truth about what may or may not have happened in his life um, it's that and then uh, and then other stuff uh, there's a, there's even an afterword talking about by uh, Kan Furuyama uh, talking about his time he spent working on a samurai legend uh, needless to say I mean if you're a Taniguchi fan, uh, you might like this. If you're a Samurai fan, you also might like this, but if you're just a casual fan, you're not really into either of those things, uh, you know, you might as well just uh, skip over that one. Whew, boy howdy, this is uh, taking in a quite a long update. At least it feels long. Uh, let's see, next up we have Platinum End, Volume 1. This is the new... The new uh, series being put out by Oba and Obata, the same people who gave us uh, Death Note and uh, Bakuman, and I especially like the uh, nice, the nice uh, cover here, where it's all kind of shiny and stuff. That's always a, a neat little uh, thing. I always get a, you know, anything like that is a nice little added touch. Uh, so this series focuses on um, a classmate, um, uh, one classmate, um, Mirai, who is who is mostly saddened because of his troubled life, and he's planning to commit suicide until an angel comes and actually saves his life. And then it's later revealed that uh, because he committed suicide, that uh, for whatever reason, um, she has decided, that the angel has decided to uh, grant Mirai various uh, abilities, various angel abilities to uh, make him want to uh, enjoy life again. And also because he's been unwillingly conscripted into uh, this this tournament type setup to uh, to uh, choose who will be the next god.
as you do, and and so what she what she outlines for him is that uh, is that being a God candidate, one of thirteen, uh, she uh, he will get a hold of uh, three various abilities. Uh, one one is he'll get wings, which uh, the, all these powers are only things that he can see and other candidates can see. So again, it's kind of the same thing as like you know Death Note rules. Only the users can see other users, and then also. Uh, you also get an arrow, which uh, you get two different kinds of arrows. You either get a red, you can get a red arrow, which uh, the red arrows, anyone that you shoot the arrow with will fall in love with you for up to 30 days. And, and they'll do whatever you tell them to do because they're in love with you. And then the white arrows will outright kill you. They'll kill you like with a heart attack instantly. Again, kind of, very death note-y. A lot of the... A lot of the concepts uh, mentioned in here are, you can say that they were borrowed from Death Note. Uh, like, you know, the Wings thing, uh, there was the time Light Yagami was saying how he would never trade half his life for uh, the Shikigami I trade, but that uh, he actually said that he would do it if it could give him, you know, the Shikigami Wings. Uh, and then, and then also the 30 day rule is also from Death Note. Uh, the the uh, kill with a heart attack is like from Death Note as well, um, but the uh, but the interesting thing here though is that again there's only 13 candidates, and all and the whole thing is like at the end of 90 day, uh, I think she says at the end of uh, at the end of uh, 90 days or uh, so many days that uh, they will choose a choose one particular candidate to be the winner and that winner will then you know become become a you know the uh, the uh, uh, real god basically and uh, and that also there are various uh, ranked angels and uh, you know she's one of the higher ranked angel angels but lower ranked angels uh, didn't necessarily get all the angel gifts so uh, he's actually at a bit of an advantage this time around but there is actually an interesting twist at the end of this volume uh, that that I wasn't expecting at all. That'll be pretty interesting uh, for the volumes to come and how that relates to it. Uh, overall, I think it's an interesting start to a cool series. Uh, you know, same guys, Oba and Obata. They, I, I like both the stuff they put out before, so there's no reason for me to not give at least give this a try to see what else they can do for it. Hmm. Then uh, next up, Frank and Fran, Volume Five and Six. Again, we got more of those ridiculous uh, sci-fi horror uh, mayhem that we all love from Frank and Fran. This is quickly becoming maybe one of my favorite mangas of all time, Frank and Fran. Just just because it's so it the tone is so perfect with its with its execution and its plots. It's so ridiculous it it knows exactly what it's trying to do and it doesn't compromise on itself you know it's just a shame that it's only it's only eight volumes you know i could i would i would probably read like you know a hundred or more of these frank and fran volumes if they could as long as they could keep the quality up i'll be interested to see how the final uh two volumes of this actually turns out with uh frank and fran and all of her crazy experiments and, and crazy uh, stuff going on. Then uh, next up we get a Haikyuu Volume 4, which uh, actually has them pitted against their first major uh, their first major team rivalry with the Nekoma uh, team, which uh, this actually details the first time the, the whole team in Haikyuu has actually fought together against uh, another group. Uh, pretty interesting. I like, I especially like the the opposing team and how some of their teammates are kind of are more or less kind of uh, mirrors of members of the main team and then and then also how uh, some of the other teammates are, are kind of are kind of also more different especially the fact that again they're they're called Nekoma so that kind of implies cat and how a lot of the characters here on this team actually have a fairly vague kind of cat motif to them in how they look, especially with the uh, the wide eyes and the slit slitted irises and stuff, it's also pretty fun. 
Uh, again, the, the volleyball action is just absolutely wonderful, and especially how uh, you know they they actually go through kind of a struggle in uh, how their initial kind of uh, tactics are being kind of seen through, and they have to adjust to uh, to fight and and uh, you know play the game. Uh, it's really fun. All right, we're we're all we're on the home stretch here. Uh, this is Ikaro volumes one and two. Uh, this this was uh, me picking up some more Chiro Taniguchi stuff. This was actually drawn by Taniguchi, written by Mobius. Mobius is the uh, is a French artist uh, who is most known for uh, drawing um, the Incal, by, written by uh, Alejandro Hjordorowski, uh, and he also did fair, a fair number of work on uh, movies. He was a consultant design. He he was uh, he worked on the storyboard and designs for uh, in Alien. He also did a lot of concept drawings for Tron. Uh, he he again he's done a lot of artwork art you know comic art in French for uh, uh, his uh, for Heavy Metal. He actually co-founded Heavy Metal magazine. Um, uh, which in uh, French I think it's a uh, metal horant. Um, I may have got that completely wrong. Um, and uh, so and so it's interesting that uh, this is a that you would be you would get this kind of pairing here. Which uh, uh, you know I read it. Um, it's it's a sci-fi story about a guy who's codenamed Ikaro. He's a boy that was born with the ability to fly. Just the ability to to sort of levitate under his own power, and you know, you get this whole, uh, this whole secret mi uh, government agency that that has Ikaro under lock and key, and they're trying to figure out, uh, you know, the limits to his abilities, and also whether or not they can replicate it to uh, to be used in for uh, other people, either for uh, benefits or or for you know for military uh, application. And uh, you know the whole time he's living inside, he gets this one girl who comes to visit him, and something happens to her, and this prompts Ikaro to actually uh, try to uh, break out and you know just fly away. And it's him, you know, finally, finally uh, developing wants and needs, and then breaking out is basically the plot of the story. Um, uh, I would say that like uh, it. This this story is okay. It you know there's a lot of these kind of weird stream of conscious moments in it when when you know Ikaro is kind of flying around and stuff or he's sort of daydreaming and then there's also a subplot with a uh, with various psychics who are part of this kind of terrorist group but uh, you know it's it's like I don't know it it doesn't fit right again with uh, the story is just not that engaging like for for a lot of uh, for a lot of stuff like uh, that are like what mobius does uh the stories can be kind of more bland or kind of less interesting but usually it's made up for it by uh the artwork the artwork usually is is where it where things really shine and with and with someone like um like jiro taniguchi he's just he's a very good um, it, I, I don't want to say it like he's bad, but like he's very good at just regular, regular stuff. Like he's really good at drawing characters walking. He's really good at drawing characters like delivering dialogue. He's really good at he's really good at making less interesting things look more interesting and more detailed. He I have yet to see him do. Like a very high action-packed kind of story, and and there be something interesting. Like a good example is like this scene right here. Like, like the way it's drawn, there just doesn't seem to be like a whole lot of action going on. Like, it looks almost like static, like a static moment when there should be more movement, like going on. Like I should be able to see the motion going on as he's going around. Now, you compare that to, like, say, here, where characters are just, you know, walking along and talking, like, that looks pretty cool. 
Like he does a great job of that, where they where it looks na very natural, very interesting. It's just you know when he draws like extreme facial expressions, where like characters confessing their love or something, like it just doesn't look as good. It doesn't look as natural from from his perspective. Even even something like where you know the scene where Ikki. I Ikaro is like breaking his jail cell and he's trying to just fly out of this containment room with the whole thing still attached to him like it just it just doesn't look that good like it looks like I'm looking at a like Katsuhiro Otomo but like with Otomo at least there's he does better action he draws more action when when he's drawing something happening uh, with this it doesn't it just doesn't look like that it just it's okay. Uh, that's all I can really say about it. It was kind of a neat little story. If you want, uh, if Mobius had drawn Ikaro for himself, I think maybe it would have turned out better because Mobius has such a unique drawing style and a unique kind of vision that I don't think Taniguchi can really replicate that sense for himself. Um, it's also worth noting that actually, uh, at the beginning of book two, um, that he says, I, it would have probably been thrown aside and forgotten. Fortunately, uh, Ikaro had survived and seen the light thanks to Jiro Taniguchi. Uh, and that, it, so, so, the, so I mean, you know, you could say that, you know, Taniguchi helped to uh, bring Ikaro to life by having an interest to wanting to draw it, but on the other hand, I can see it as, uh, Mobius wrote the story and didn't really have a strong interest to to draw it himself. Like he already had the the concept, the idea out, and then he found somebody else who wanted to draw, it and he was like, "Okay, go for it," and then did that. So it, it just feels like he it's kind of like something he had in mind, but he just didn't have enough enough oomph in it to really make it work. Which again, Mobius's other stuff, like I've heard great stuff about, like. The airtight garage and a lot of his other Mobius, uh, Mobius gallery stories that he's put out, which I think are all getting reprinted finally after being out of print for decades, which I'm happy to see. But uh, this one is just, it's just okay. It's not really that great, and it's like, if you really like a lot of those early '90s like sci-fi stuff. From uh, from like a lot of those anime sci-fi stuff, like Rojin Z or something, where it's kind of quirky, it's not too detailed, not too complicated, but there's a little bit of sci-fi, a little bit of an interesting idea in there, and it's mostly carried through visuals, and it's kind of there and done in a short amount of time. This is what you're gonna get out of that. It's like it like uh for again for Taniguchi I don't think it's that particularly great. I think it's just okay. So I know that's not really a great recommendation, but I mean I'm just saying that's how I felt about it. Now, to get something that Taniguchi did that was that I would say is amazing is a uh, Hotel Harbor View. These were uh two stories by uh, Jiro Taniguchi um writer uh, Natsuo Sekika Sekikawa, which both of these stories, I would say, are absolutely excellent because of the fact that uh, most of them are based around kind of a build-up, and again, most of the stories here are just about, you know, characters that are kind of just going through life, they're doing kind of a very basic, a lot of just very sort of mundane kind of talking and and dialogue, and then you get it punctuated with this this dynamic sort of action at the end, and and uh, a lot of this kind of noir sort of feel makes it very interesting and very rewarding to read through. And again, they're all fairly short. Uh, you know, the first story, uh, Hotel Harbor View, is uh, is about a man who uh, has decided to end his life, but he's also decided to end his life on his own terms in a in a sort of uh, fantastical role-play kind of way and the first half you get to see how he uh, you know kind of you get to see a glimpse of kind of his ideas and mindsets with how he with him hiring a woman and then hiring to take pictures of her in various positions and like he's he likes 
being in control. He likes having the setup and, and having everything go the way he wants it to go. And then you see how he commits suicide and how he chooses it and how that plays into it. And it's all very well done. It's all very interesting how he does it. And then the second part is, again, about a woman who uh, is obsessed with a man who has apparently forgotten about her, a man that trained her to be a killer and who has forgotten about her and how she wants nothing more than to than for him to remember her and she, and she does all these things sets all of these different plans into motion all for the ultimate payoff of him remembering her just so that he can so so that she can kill him having remembered who she was that for her that that means as much as even completing the job of killing him uh, both of these fantastic stories to read through, uh, and I highly recommend it, especially if you're a Taniguchi fan and you want to see maybe some of the best stuff that I think he's done. Um, and I know I haven't seen... Uh, I recently just got all of his uh, Summon of the Gods, which, uh, you know, w with how well he did a quest for the Hidden Girl, uh, I have no doubt that that'll turn out uh, excellent. And then also Times of Botchan, which... Uh, Times of Botchan, I actually have have very little interest in getting. I just haven't heard anything good about it. And on top of that, it's the the listing has it as uh, four volumes have come out, but there were supposed to be ten total. So it feels like it's a fairly incomplete story of uh, of it. But again, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Uh, you know, if anybody out there actually got that and has any detail about it, um, you know leave a comment or something uh and also on top of that i've heard that uh you know it's based off of a novel of uh, the novel of bachan and that you actually had to have read the novel to understand a lot of things that are then brought up in the manga so it also feels incomplete from uh, an adaptation standpoint uh you know so all those things combined so last thing here um I, you know, I think is uh, I thought was really great, and I was like, really, actually, I think the uh, first thing I read this month was uh, the Super Mario Adventures. These are the a collection of the Super Mario Adventure uh, comics that were presented in Nintendo Power Magazine, much the same way as uh, Legend of Zelda: a Link to the Past was uh, was also released uh, last year, I believe. Uh, same you know style and format. Uh, these are absolutely wonderful. They're all they're all re you know colorized and you know they're in nice high glossy paper and they're just they're just you know Mario and Luigi trying to uh, rescue Princess Peach from uh, from Bowser who plans to marry her in this weird uh, you know wedding kind of thing. And then there's also a little extra bonus comic about uh, Mario encountering a. Uh, Wario at the end here, and and uh, you know it's by the same guy. Um, what's his name? Who uh, originally uh, did uh, you know even a monkey can draw manga? Uh, that guy, and uh, you know the same humor from that is the same humor in uh, in this, which you know with the uh, with the success of this coming out, uh, I hope that even more of the Nintendo Power. Uh, comic stuff comes out. Like, I know there's a Fo Star Fox one, which I'd be all over a Star Fox uh, Nintendo Power comic. Uh, and then also, I think there was also a Super Metroid one um, and a few others. But needless to say, this is tons of fun, tons of crazy over-the-top action from uh, Mario and the gang. Um, if you've ever been a fan of, of Super Mario World or, or any of those other Super Mario games, uh, it just... All of the all of the fun art is just so much fun. Um, you know, if I had to be really honest, I would say that you know, Legend of Zelda: A Link to the Past might not be for everyone because it's by uh, Shotaro Ishinomori, and he draws it in a fairly, you know, old school classic kind of style from the '60s, and you know, he draws it the same way he drew Cyborg Zero Zero Nine. Uh, 009. Um, even one of the guys, you know, is Cyborg 002, basically, that same character model. So, if, you know, I could see how somebody could look at that and see it looking kind of dated, but as far as Super Mario Adventures, uh, 
I would say they're a perfect representation of the of the Plummer brothers and uh, you know all the crazy insanity that ensues that you would expect from uh, you know being in the Mushroom Kingdom. Uh, you know they even have a part where they go and uh, you know they fight the uh, the uh, uh, the booze inside a haunted cast inside the uh, little haunted mansion. Uh, there's there's all kinds of fun where they're riding on Yoshi and stuff. Uh, you know if if you had to get one thing. Uh, from a, from a, you know, for for a kid to to read and check out, I would definitely recommend Super Mario Adventures. Uh, you know, I'm always a big fan of, of finding anything that's really fun that kids can read and enjoy, that's in a comic book format. Um, and something like Super Mario Adventures, I would definitely say, is uh, definitely uh, right exactly that kind of style and and humor. Uh, so anyway, that's all I got for uh, October manga update, and uh, this was definitely a uh, much bigger one than normal, uh, which I was glad. I managed to get uh, almost in a full spectrum of, of manga to read, you know, minus shoujo. I didn't have any shoujo, but what are you going to do, I guess? Uh, almost perfect. Anyway, check y'all for next month. Okay.